Okay. Um, I'm going to try to so, pull the flag. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Tuesday, June 9th, 2020 Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting via Zoom video conferencing. Uh, can we stand and pledge allegiance? <laughs> Do we have a flag down? There we go. I'm, She's I'm, good. I'm trying here. Awesome. I'm not doing so well. You're doing great. Uh, for some reason, the flag is not coming up. <laughs> <laughs> you have one out your window, don't you? I'm doing that right now. I love the way we do it to Donna's flag. All right, there it is. I see it. Okay, I pledge allegiance Just to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America, America and to and the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, for all. all. Thank you, Donna. Uh, may I have any item number one is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments? There's Sonia coming in. Uh, yes, Hope. Hi. Um, yeah, so I don't know if it quite qualifies as an adjustment, but item number um, letter E under part Six, seven, new business. Um, it should read, uh, consider to approve policy JLCA. It's not technically a second reading, and I'll elaborate on that later. So I would just strike out second reading. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Nope. Okay. Um, may I have a, um, a motion for item number two? I move, I move we approve the board minutes from May 12th, 2020. Second. Can I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Laura. Any comments or discussion? All those in favor? Oh, we have to do it this way. Sorry. Um, so we will vote. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you. Item number three, comments from student representatives. Uh, Allie, there you are. Welcome. Hey. So um, as all of you know, we were supposed to have our graduation on Sunday, and unfortunately we couldn't have it, but I know um, a lot of our classmates got together with families or fam family members or friends to have an, either a mock, uh, mock graduation or just a small celebration um, to celebrate our accomplishments. And I know it wasn't what we thought um, or how we thought we were, we were going to go or end our senior year. Um, but I know a lot of us are, or all of us are looking forward to our graduation in August and just the future celebrations that, um, that are going to, and just our future ahead. So that is good. And on another note, um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really enjoyed um, being a school board representative this year and getting to meet all of you. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you um, for all that you did and will continue to do to make our school a better place. So thank you. <laughs> well, we enjoyed having you. Um, so we, the appreciation is right back at you. Thanks for being here and giving us all the updates and um, congratulations. I know it's a unique year, but I have to commend 
um, seniors on, um, I don't want to overuse this word, but the resiliency. I think um, you all have, from what I've heard and witnessed and seen, um, just approach this very unique experience and loss of certain rites of passage with so much grace and uh, maturity. So um, I commend you and your classmates and congratulations. Congratulations, Allie. Thank you guys. Really appreciate congratulations. it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any comments from the public on the, uh, on any agenda items? I don't, participants, don't see any hands being raised. Okay. Uh, we have presentation recognition of retirees. So our first retiree is um, Bernard Shannon. Uh, I don't think he's with us, but uh, Bernie has been working for the town of Cape Elizabeth for 26 years. He started working um, at a home care facility and then in 1997 began working for the maintenance department. He is known for his teamwork and for having genuine pride in his community and his workplace. And Perry is going to say a few words about Bernie. Yeah, I, I don't have anything formal pre prepared, but I, I just actually I wanted to ditto a little bit of what uh, Donna had said that uh, Bernie leaving is a huge amount of institutional knowledge leaving us, although he has graciously offered to uh, be on call as we need him if we ever get in a pinch or something like that or need to pick his, his brain a little bit. We are fortunate enough that he is almost a stone's throw from the high school and uh, can conveniently just shoot right over when we need him. Um, like Donna had said, his, his loyalty to both the town and the school and the service to the buildings, um, he, the, the work that he did is, or, or is still doing, but um, the, the work that he was, is doing is, you know, doing it as if it's his own home. Um, he, he, everything is done with, you know, A plus effort and, and total quality. Um, could always be counted on. Uh, there was many times where I've called Bernie uh, late at night or even early 2 a.m. in the morning one time for a situation that we had at a, uh, the swimming pool that was discovered by a custodian and uh, needed emergency attention. And, um, you know, he just always sees projects to the end. Uh, they're, they're, <laughs> It can be a challenge sometimes, but a project is not done until Bernie has given an approval that it's done, um, which, you know, for scheduling reasons can be a challenge, but he, uh, like I said, he, he, it's A plus work from him. And, and that's it. Uh, it. He will be a loss, but I, I wish him the best with his retirement. And like I said, if we need him, he has offered it his, his, uh, his knowledge to us in the future. Thank you, Perry. Our next retiree is Deborah Casey, and Deb has worked for the Cape Elizabeth School Department for about 28 years. She began working as a speech and language clinician before focusing on teaching where she's taught math and social studies for most of her career, uh, but most recently she's been a seventh grade math teacher at the middle school. Um, so congratulations, Deb, and um, Tori is going to say a few words about you. <laughs> So I think I must have shared my email with Donna because she just stole everything that I had written about Deb. Um, so I don't know how that happened, but um, I'm really fortunate. And I, and I think whenever people move into new buildings in any role, whether it's a coworker, a teacher, a peer, a supervisor, whatever it is, you know, we're fortunate if we have some veteran staff to kind of um, go to and, and really kind of get the lay of the land and you get some of the history and I feel really fortunate both for Deb and Lisa later that um, often I've gone to them just to kind of get the real story sometimes on the history of something or, you know, how did this arrive? How did this come to be? And Deb is very upfront and forthright, <laughs> you know, and she will tell me how it is no matter what the day um, or the topic, which I appreciate because it saves many conversations. Um, and 
so I was, I know she's been planning her retirement for a while and you know, it's really been, it's a little bit, it's, it's kind of bittersweet because typically the school and the staff, we, we do a bunch of events and have some fun with, with their retirements. And um, this remote learning has kind of put a damper on all of that. So we, we have some things planned, but um, the storytelling and all of that is going to have to wait, I guess, for, for some other time um, from the, from her peers. So they didn't want to give me a lot of, of the juicy stories because they have a plan for using them themselves. Um, but all that being said, oh I have, <laughs> but all of that being said, I appreciate Deb so much. And it's, you need those type of people that you can count on. They're there every day at work. Um, and they're willing to do whatever is asked of them and they, and they value helping their peers. So when I get hired, I was fortunate. We, you know, I came in with a bunch of new people and um, we've been fortunate to have some veteran leadership there that, that can kind of show what the Cape Way is about. And Deb definitely represents that. Um, the one thing I think that Deb did share with me um, was that she's been there a long time, nothing too exciting. My roots are too deep, I guess. And I think that really says a lot that uh, the people that I've met at Cape, and they tend to stay there for a long time because it's a great place to be. And it's a great place to be because all these people are staying for a long time. So Deb, I, I hope that I can call on you because I know you live down the road um, in the future. And and I, I just wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. I was just going to say, anytime you want my advice or opinion, you know you can you know you can get it from me anytime. <laughs> I really been, appreciate you being there. And it's been... Oh, it's been a, a lot of fun in the you know the last couple of years with you guys there and you know I I've enjoyed my time at Cape and I I do wish like we all do that <clears throat> things hadn't turned out this way but um yeah it's the way it goes so thank you very much thank you thank you Deb um, and our next retiree is Elizabeth Leonard, and we know her as Lisa. She's worked for Cape Elizabeth School Department for 19 years, uh, first as a sub, then as an ed tech, and um, then being hired as the world language teacher at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Uh, she's been a longtime leader of the department on, and on several occasions mentored new hires. So Troy, did I steal all of what you had to say? <laughs> um, almost all of it, but I did reach out to Lisa because I, I um, in person, I would love to chat and build these, these kind of moments up a little bit, but I, I want to make sure I get it all straight. So I went right to Lisa as I did Deb. Um, and the thing that you missed out on was she started working in an advertising agency in New York City right after college, which I did not know about her, um, and worked in advertising for about 10 years before moving to Maine, where it continued for about another 10. And then... You, you know, and I, and I think this really switching careers and making that decision to take the plunge into, you know, what am I going to do and subbing first and, and finding that passion for teaching. Um, I think that really says a lot about who she is. And um, unlike Deb, we really had, Lisa and I hadn't really talked about retiring until the one day in my office, you know, I kind of got it thrown on me and I was absolutely shocked. Um, not in a bad way, but I was just so surprised. And um, it is gonna be a huge loss for us. And, and she's so strong at, at teaching and making relationships with kids and their families and knowing the history of all the people in Cape. And just that institutional knowledge is so powerful and valuable. Um, she can tell me how the world language you know, was 10 years ago and, you know, what was good about it and what was bad about it. And, and she's a great advocate for the program and for her kids. So um, I have, she did add, you know, that um, she's ready for some new adventures, even though she might have to postpone them for a while, but she's really optimistic. <laughs> so um, Lisa, I don't know if you're out there, um, but thank she you for everything that you've done for us. Um, you will definitely be missed at the middle school. Um, so thank you. Well, I've had a great time. And as I, I wrote to Troy, it really was a dream come true for me to be a teacher here. And I'm, I'm a really good at crying as well as many other things. <laughs> <laughs> it's just pretty emotional. I just, I loved being a teacher. I loved being a teacher at Cape. And, um, you know, there were some ups and downs for sure. But, 
you know, all in all, when I look back at, at my time at Cape, I just have the most wonderful feeling about what happened. And I'm just so thankful that I was hired. And uh, I will miss you. But hopefully, I'll be able to sub when things get back to normal. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Um, now, Jeff was supposed to talk about the next two retirees. And um, for some reason, he, Jeff, are you on anywhere? I don't see him. Um, so I will talk about what I know. Uh, Stephanie Babin is our next retiree, and she has worked for three years as an ed tech in Cape Elizabeth High School. Prior to joining our district, she was an adjunct professor at York Community College and a graphic and com computer technology teacher um, in Old Orchard Beach. So Jeff was going to talk about Adele. I'm really going to put you on the spot. Can, <laughs> can you say a few words about Stephanie? <clears throat> sure. Well, I've known Stephanie for the last two years, and um, one of the special things about Stephanie is um, she's very much a team player, and all of our special ed teams in each building are special, but particularly at the high school, um, there's a lot of flexibility with regard to special ed delivery, and um, with regard to what they, they run into on a daily basis, and the fact that many of them shift around and support each other as needed. And she's been great with that. She's very compassionate with the students she serves. And I think we've been very fortunate to have her. I certainly wish her well in her retirement. And um, I can, John and I can both speak to Chris Newell. <laughs> okay. You want me to, Chris? I work with Chris because she teaches math as do I. And we've, I've always enjoyed um, our meetings and our conversations. Uh, we've been pretty much on the same wavelength, I think, for quite a few years about math and things. And I didn't know you were retiring. I was very surprised. I did not know you were. So congratulations to you. But um, it's a loss for the high school. John, do you want to say something about Chris Newell? <laughs> Oh, he's like, eh, I don't want to mess it up. Um, so um, it's going to be a big loss for the high school, for the kids, and just the integrity, I think, of the whole math department. I think you were a big part of it, and I think Thank kids you. learned a lot from you. So. Thanks, Deb. So I'm going to give a little bit of Chris's history. So she's worked for the school department for 21 years. She took a brief time off to raise her children and then returned to teach math at Cape Elizabeth High School. And um, Chris, you have served on many, many, many committees, uh, mentored numerous new hires, advised clubs and departments. Uh, you've worked with our students in many co and extracurricular activities uh, throughout your career and Kathy Sank is going to say a little bit about you, too. <laughs> well, Chris. Um, so Chris knows that um, I've been um, deeply opposed to this retirement thing since she first <laughs> <laughs> let me know that it was in the offing. Um, I know her in many ways. Um, both as a math teacher, whom I have tremendous respect for, um, and also as the advisor of the volunteer club, although I'm not sure if that's what its name is, but especially um, because we've served together on the, on the certification committee since I started in Cape Elizabeth, and she showed me the ropes, and she did it with a smile, and I remember one time I was feeling very, very frustrated, and um, I was cranky, and I apologized, and and Chris said something to the effect of, if, if that's the best you can do um, in terms of being cranky, you have a long way to go. Um, so, which I just think, I mean, I was really being cranky, but she made me feel like <clears throat> it was all okay. It was all gonna be good. It was all gonna be fine. So it's just a huge, huge loss for our com community. And, um, but we just can't thank you enough for everything you've done for Cape Elizabeth, for the students. And, uh, and a staff. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Chris, do you want to say a few words? Do you want to hear it? Oh, is that Garth coming into it? Oh, it's does, Garth. Does Garth want to say a few words about Chris? <laughs> I had the pleasure of teaching with Chris for six or seven years at North Dartmouth Academy, <laughs> and uh, she was an amazing mentor to me and uh, did a fabulous job chairing the department. And uh, well, we took a trip to Washington, D.C. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Quebec City with the students and uh, mm -hmm. just a passionate educator, always there for the kids, uh, always there for the kids, the time and the connections you made. Uh, uh, were inspiring to me in, in my teaching career. So I'm glad I get to bump into you around town and up at Sugarloaf, mm -hmm. but um, uh, the schools will be, uh, you know, big shoes to fill, big loss uh, with moving on. You'll be missed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been my pleasure to be here. I, I started in 92 as well. And actually I started in October because one of my son's math teacher was leaving and I figured I was a stay at home mom at that time. I, I had teaching, I had credentials, I had a degree. And I figured if I had applied for the job, at least whoever would take a, a math teaching job in October was at least as qualified as I, as I was. So I, <laughs> and I've been there ever since. It was, you know, I have loved working with the kids. I've continued to travel, like Garth said, everywhere from the soup kitchen to Cuba. You know, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, I'll really miss things. I, I've been timing athletic events for 14 years too. So to sit on the, t on the sideline with the kids as they're coming and going off the field or, or off the ice, I, I time ice hockey games too. And it's just been a, a real pleasure. So I thank you for the opportunity as well. Jeff, would you like to say something about Christine? <laughs> yeah, first I want to apologize. I think this is the first time in 19 years, I've forgotten that the school board starts at 30 and 77. I was starting to worry. I'm so sorry. Um, so, and I particularly apologize to you, Chris. Um, I'm mad at myself. Um, so, I, but I will say a couple words uh, about Chris. Um, she is, as a teacher, a teacher who will step in and she's capable. She's super smart and she is capable of teaching any class from pre-algebra to calculus. Um, and she is one who will just say, whatever you need me to do, I will do. And one of the things that we have uh, reliably needed her to do uh, all the time is geometry because it's not every <laughs> math teacher's favorite love. Um, and Chris loves to teach it and does a great job. And I will miss going in. I've observed Chris many, many times over the years. I will miss going in and admiring her for the clarity, the organization, the respectfulness that she shows the kids and the kids show her. Um, she's, she's, she's just a super solid teacher and a huge loss and quite, a, quite beyond losing Chris as a teacher. She is one of those teachers who does, goes above and beyond. Um, and she, I just came in on the tail end where she was talking about what she does with track. Um, she's a timer, she's a scorer, she's our volunteer coordinator, she believes in community, she believes in service. Um, she's been the certification committee chair for as long as I can remember to help teach, helping teachers get through. Um, she just does a super job. And I do want to say as well, just, just to end up, because I know I'm late, so I'm not going to go on and on, although I could. Um, she is a huge advocate for girls' sports. Um, in Cape Elizabeth High School, um, and in particular, a huge advocate for the girls' ice hockey program. Mm -hmm. And in part, that was because she had a daughter who played in girls' ice hockey, but her interest and avidness in girls' ice hockey preceded and continued after um, Jackie completed her high school career. She's just been a huge advocate for girls in math, mm -hmm. a huge advocate for girls in ice hockey, a huge advocate for girls finding their voices. So um, I will personally miss her and I'm glad at least I got here for the last moment or two to say a few words because she's so deserving and we will absolutely miss her. Thank you. Jeff, did you want to say something about Stephanie as well? Yeah, so um, St is Stephanie here or is... I, I don't think so, but... Um... 
So Stephanie is, she's only been at the high school for four or five years, um, and she made a huge impact when she got here. Um, she's been in ed tech um, here for the last several years, and she's just a ball of energy um, and a ball of compassion for kids. Probably her biggest specialty, um, at least until remote learning started, was really helping kids with paths. Um, kids who are really interested in pursuing what paths have, to, have uh, had to offer them, um, finding their skills, tapping their interests. But kids, Stephanie would work with kids who needed more support and more structure. So over the years, she has become an expert in auto body mechanics and culinary things. And I, I remember one day going to her, Kathy will know who I'm talking about, but going to her to help out going to paths with a student who is just a recent EL student and whose English was really, really, really behind. Um, and I went up to her one day and said, would you consider helping this young man and attend the auto mechanics program? And she, she just threw herself into it. She threw herself into the course. She threw herself in and, and she just loved the teacher. He was a kid who was pretty isolated and she formed a great relationship and learned how to say muffler and exhaust system and everything else in another language that she never spoken before. And she was always talking to me about how much she learned. And the other thing I will say that Steph, that Beth Milroy, who's her teacher supervisor for our special needs program, uh, told me is that she has been a rock star in remote learning. She has been the go-to person, particularly for technology ideas, to help students with real special needs and adapt the program to, to what they needed and finding new tools. And I didn't know that about her, but she has been a super go-to person that has helped the entire staff helping um, our, most, uh, our, our most needy students to really benefit, get some benefit out of remote learning. So, I will definitely miss her go-to-ness, her willingness to say yes to anything we ask, and her high, high energy. We're missing two, we're losing two rock stars. Um, and, um, and congratulations to both of them. So yes, congratulations to all our retirees. We wish you well, and I hope you have many wonderful adventures in your future. Um, at this point, we would normally have a little break and do a reception, so um, we, we lift our punch glasses to you retirees and um, really wish you well. I don't know if anybody else on the board wants to say anything. Great. Well, have a wonderful retirement, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Next up is a uh, principal's update. Jason, would you like to start? Thank you. Yes, sure. Good evening. It's great to see everyone. I'm looking around and you, got, you all look wonderful and I'm realizing that I'm starting to let myself go at these meetings a little bit. <laughs> and I'll, I'll shave next time. Uh, but <laughs> it's good to see you. I just get so comfortable here after a while. These meetings have been going on forever, you know. Um, but it is wonderful to see you and um, I do, I want to thank the board and um, the community for all the support that we've been given throughout the emergency remote learning. Um, it's been challenging for all stakeholders, um, and but at the same time, all stakeholders have been very positive. Uh, so just, we really appreciate that. So right now is a really busy time at Pond Cove. Um, we're closing out the year. Um, teachers are, Pond Cove teachers are finishing their one-on-one -on -one conferences with every student. Um, and sometimes families are joining those, and I'm hearing that those are going really well. Um, that Teachers are um, really appreciative for that time to connect one last time with their, with their students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so, you know, we're also, um, teachers are entering the building on a, give, provided a safe plan for social distancing, only, only very limited teachers 
permitted in the building at a time, but they're coming in, they're packing up their rooms for the summer, they're preparing um, student um, personal belongings for a, a pickup. Parents will be coming next week to pick up personal belongings and drop off iPads and library books and other school property. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Teachers are attempting to um, plan for ordering materials for next year, um, which is challenging because there are many um, unknown variables <laughs> involving, um, you know, the, the funds to order things as well as what to order, right? Depending on um, the planning that we, um, that we do over the next month or few months, um, planning for the fall. So it's, it's a very challenging time, but it's also exciting. Um, what we're really starting to do now is we're really closing out the year is reflecting, celebrating things that went well. Uh, there are lots of lessons that we've learned that will stick with us. Um, and, you know, we're also reflecting on things that didn't go so well in, in everything that we've learned. So, um, and on a final note, um, something that has, um, I've been very appreciative of most recently, I've been having a lot of conversations with community members, uh, parents. So about a couple different things. I've been having um, phone discussions with parents who really struggled with remote learning, um, phone discussions with parents who in families who really thrived, um, and also a lot of discussions um, um, around uh, racial equity um, in Cape Elizabeth and throughout the great, throughout the country. Uh, and so, um, I'm just so appreciative of the discussions that we're having now and, and people are reaching out and they're feeling comfortable to reach out and talk to us. And I just want to continue to promote that, um, that anybody can reach out anytime and share information, ask questions, um, and it, it makes us better and stronger. So that's all I have for tonight. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Troy. So we, so I think I'm up. So um, at the middle school, we are pretty much in the same boat that Jason just described. Um, you know, the, the, the end of the year, has, it's just the whole thing has been a little um, weird for people. Uh, I think teachers and, and students, those relationships they are building throughout the year and, and they hit kind of, you know, really high gear, mid-year-ish and um, and then the goodbyes at the end of the year, I think people are starting to realize the power that those really have. Um, and it's not just a beach day, which in the past, I've kind of felt that some too. And in those types of things, those activities really are purposeful. And I think this reminds us of that. And kids really do want that closure with their classmates and their teachers. And the teachers also miss and want that. So. Um, today, for the last two days, we've started with our, our laptop and iPad collection and, and kids coming to get their stuff. And the teachers were excited to get in there. They wanted to be a part of that process. They wanted to see the kids. Um, we had to make sure, we tried to organize it so they could pull ahead a little bit and not cause a bottleneck because they all want to chat it up um, and kind of catch up and, and do that stuff. So it's just it's been a really, I think it's been really informative for our teachers and for our staff and definitely for our students and, and me, just it kind of reiterates the strength of those bonds that teachers can have and the impacts they can have on kids. Um, so um, with all that stuff said, we have been working, we've got our rooms cleaned out largely, um, working on next placements for next year. It, and what we're also realizing is we are really kind of face to face people and and being in the hallways and the conversations and, and you know, having someone to ask the questions to right down the hall, that's a different, it's very different doing that remotely. Um, so we know that some placements for next year may be slightly off compared to the past. We've talked to parents about that, that it's, it's okay. We know we can work on it in the fall and we can, we can try to get them right. And we'll do our best to do that ahead of time. But right now it's really working on class placements, um, making sure that people are where they need to be and then the ordering is, is a bit of a challenge. Like Jason said, it's kind of a moving target a little bit, um, preparing for a few different potential scenarios and teachers really wanting to um, become better at remote learning. If that's something that was to continue, they want to take what they've learned, um, get some more professional development and really 
become really strong at it. And I think there's potential for that to really happen. Um, but yeah, so other than that, it's, it's very strange to be in the middle school in the building and have it be so quiet at this time of year. And um, it just starts to buzz when the teachers start to come back in like today. And it, and it kind of comes back alive. So um, with all, all that stuff said, I think we're in good shape. It's, it's been kind of a limp to the finish line in some ways. And in some ways it's been a sprint. Um, so I think it's been, it's going okay. Is there any questions? Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Um, so just a couple things. We um, got, got diplomas to seniors last Thursday. That was a lot of fun. I wanted to point out two people in particular who don't often get the limelight that they uh, deserve. And one is Pat Fowler, um, who's been the transportation coordinator here for a long, 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 long time. And I always knew she knew Cape Elizabeth like the back of her hand, but I really know now that she knows it like the back of her hand. I mean, she mapped out a route, a flawless route that got diplomas to every single student. Um, and then she decided she was going to come with us, with, which was a last minute decision. So we had her last minute navigation um, as well, making, making little tweaks and corrections and things like that. So it was fun to see her and she was really enjoying herself, um, seeing the kids and seeing the smiles. And the other one I wanted to point out, and I'll, you know, this Dave Brown was our bus driver. Um, and, and, and it was just, it was just fascinating watch, watching Dave interact with kids that he probably, many of whom he hadn't driven a bus for in many, many years, but they all remembered him. Many of them wanted to take pictures with him. And then whenever he saw somebody, I guess his current bus route is down in the, uh, the sh um, Broad Cove area. Um, and so as we were cruising through the Broad Cove area, going to different seniors' houses, anytime he saw a little kid who he knew on his bus run, all of a sudden the bus would safely come to a stop and they would scream out the window, um, wishing and just saying hi to this kid. And it was so neat to see the little kids react to Dave in such a, a really cool way that they just love Mr. Brown and he loves them. And it was really super powerful. So that was really cool. Um, we had, so our ninth to 11th graders today dropped off all their, um, all their school property except for iPads. They're dropping those off on Friday after they finish their resilience projects. We had a good team of teachers and support staff um, and helping us out with that, that process. It was done in a really carefully staged timed way. Um, and I think, I think it was safely done. Um, and so, so, so that, that was good. So, the, oh, the other thing I want to come back to on the diploma drop off is to thank the folks at Project Graduation because we were not only giving diplomas, but giving some other stuff that Project Graduation had purchased um, to sort of try to make the, that drop off process special. Um, the other thing I do want to mention, we do have graduation on August 5th at 5 o'clock p.m. Um, I am desperate to share all the details with everybody, but there's been for the last week and a half one dot of an eye that isn't quite done and we and I don't want to announce details and then have run any risk at all that we're going to be taking away something that because I'm, I'm very confident that's going to happen it's going to be a great event um, in a very special and meaningful place in Cape Elizabeth I think it's going to be really cool one of the things I do want to mention is that every single one of our seniors will be graduating um, so that's 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 all which, which is awesome some of them took a little bit longer than the other than others. The last last senior finished up just yesterday, which was exciting for her, and she got all kinds of uh, congratulations. But that's that that is the product of a great effort by by the students, by parents, by teachers, and by support staff who've been supporting kids along the way. Um, just just a great job, really well done, and I couldn't be prouder of the work that everybody's been doing to support those guys. That's my my report. Thank you for that. Um, I just, I want to commend all of you, all three schools, all 
the leadership that's coming from the schools for these remarkable times of having to adjust and um, do things so radically different and make it happen um, and make it seem on the outside like it is happening with ease and flawlessly. I'm sure that is not the case, um, but it's really impressive from the outsider's view. Um, so thank you so much for all you're doing. Uh, next up is uh, Dell, if you could speak, please. Thank you. Sure. Evening, everyone. Um, with regard to special education, most of the staff have been working very hard to finish up the year. And I would like to take a moment to thank all of the staff because the last, last three months have been quite challenging as they have worked very hard to pull together a, a remote learning plan for all of our students while at the same time taking care of many of their own families. Um, during the day and uh, being able to do both things. And um, actually many of them have refined that and developed skills along the way. And I'm very impressed with them and I just wanna thank them all. Um, the big focus right now for me has been uh, working on uh, ESY or extended school year. And this year extended school year for our students with, uh, who receive special services um, will be delivered remotely. Um, it'll take place in July, between July 6th and July 30th. It's a four week program. The, we'll have 37 students attending uh, extended school year. And we have 16 staff who have volunteered to work during that time. Um, overall, we're servicing 169 students in special education. We have two students that are outplaced at special purpose private schools. And we have, currently we have 23 in referral, keeping in mind that um, we have had to defer most testing over, over the last three months because it requires you to be in person. Otherwise it uh, messes with the standardization of the evaluations we deliver. Uh, any questions? Uh, Del, yeah. could I um, just ask, is the, um, the summer, the extended learning program that your uh, services that you're offering in this summer, um, is that number sort of um, what you might have typically expected um, of student participation or is that a higher, um, perhaps? No, that, um, that is uh, average uh, compared to last year. Um, next year might be a different story as uh, once we're through COVID, we may be having some discussions with certain families with regard to um, skill deficits that may have developed over this time for some of our students. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you to all you're doing to help support the students as they move through these even more challenging times. It's really amazing, you and your staff, Del. Uh, Kathy. Hello again. Um, so preparations for summer work and professional development are underway. Um, we've asked teachers to submit applications by this Friday. Um, we are going to be giving priority to collaborative work that is designed to improve um, instruction in a remote learning environment or a combination of remote learning and uh, in-person for all of the obvious reasons. Um, we recognize that this work, that funding for this work is contingent upon passage of the, um, of the, the, the budget as presented by all of you, but we're hopeful. Um, We've also started planning for next year. Um, this afternoon, Jason and I met with the Pond Cove content leaders to discuss the priorities and needs in ELA math, science, and social studies for next year. We also talked about technology needs and priorities and social emotional needs and priorities. Since again, as I think we've discussed, that's gonna need to be um, a priority for our students um, as they return. Um, and I'll be meeting with the, I've started and will continue to meet with the middle school teachers to discuss the same. And then I also wanted to just mention briefly some changes to the way we're gonna be um, 
communicating our curriculum, I think, um, and principals jump in at any point, but I think, I think we may have talked about how at, at, at Pond Cove, we're not gonna be providing um, a, a quantitative score, um, but that there will be a narrative provided for both an explanation of the, um, of the uh, opportunities for learning that were provided and then how um, the teacher's perception of, of how each student did. Um, at the middle school, we will also be providing on power school, a description of the remote learning period. Um, and then at the high school, um, we are hoping to have attached to the, um, to the program of studies, um, standardized syllabi that will articulate the, um, the course learning targets, so the alignment to the main learning results. Um, and again, that would just be, uh, as well as everything else that goes on a, on a syllabus, but, um, and that will be forthcoming in the next couple of months. Thank you so much. Sure. Marcy. Okay. So in our world, we are getting ready to do our year end close. So we've been doing cleanup work to get ready for that process. Our audit process has started as well. We are doing interim audit work right now. And the more we do now, the, the easier it makes the job for our auditors in August. So we try to make them happy up front so that the intense work isn't left on them in August. So that's what we're doing right now is trying to get ahead of that curve, um, which is tricky at this time of year, but you can imagine, but um, it's nice to keep them happy. So that's what we're doing with RKO auditors. And before I jump into our numbers, I just wanted to give you a couple of other interesting things that are going on right now. Um, Dawn and I just got the word today from FEMA, and it's actually through Maine Emergency Management Association. We got the word that we have been approved to be considered for eligibility for a public assistance grant through FEMA. So the threshold is pretty low, but I think, I think it's like a $3,500 threshold. However, this is good news because at least we can get consideration now for eligibility for that grant. And the contact person I have through our Cumberland County um, Emergency Management Department is also somebody that I'm in touch with. It, now that we're approved through this portal, I'm hoping we get approved through theirs as well for two different sources. So that's a little interesting thing. Fingers crossed, we'll know more if we're approved for eligibility. So we'll keep you all posted about that ASAP. The second thing I wanted to talk about um, that Donna and Perry and I have received notice from Efficiency Maine, and we've been working with Efficiency Maine with an application process uh, to be considered for the LED lighting grant. Do you, I think, we may have mentioned this before. So we have been approved, but we want to have this um, proposed to you guys tonight to, to consider and think about, to see, uh, this is one of my favorite phrases, to see if you have an appetite for considering this particular grant that Efficiency May is offering you all. So um, the three schools have been approved. But after uh, Perry and Donna and I met today, we were thinking that you probably would be most interested in the high school if you're going to be cons uh, want to consider this at all. Our deadline to accept the grant would be June 26th. And the grant that Efficiency Maine is offering is almost like a 50, it's like a, a match, almost basically a 50% match. The grant is for $37,574. The actual cost would be $35,000 for the high school. The cost, cost to us. Cost to us. So it's like, it's a little bit more than a match. And the estimated annual savings for having the LED lighting would be $18,307. That's for the high school alone. They've also um, we've approved for the middle school and elementary school, and it's approximately about the same amount for each school. We were thinking that you probably would be most interested in hearing about the opportunity through the high school, um, but this is something that we, we thought you could start thinking about and giving us direction if you'd like us to pursue it or not. Um, 
And again, we, we are looking at, it's gonna all depend on what happens after next, the next week with the budget process as well, because this would be part of our capital projects budget. And if that stays intact or, or what happens, it would be impacted by this would have an impact. Um, we would be able to consider this. Marcy, Marcy you're, you're scrambling. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Um, let me look this up. Can you all hear me now? Am I straight now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Donna, I don't know how much more you would like me to say about that. If, if that's just food for thought right now, is that like the approach that, and then in, in a week, we'll know more for you to be able to if, just think about it in your minds and uh, see what you think about that in general. Um, the Efficiency Maine likes to say, uh, what is it, bright lights, bright students, happy students, that kind of thing. And then the savings, um, Perry can speak to that more, but the savings is estimated to be 18,000 a year from on the electricity side. So that's just uh, something for you all to just start thinking about. Anybody, oh, I know, I'm, oh, go ahead. Does anybody want to ask Marcy any questions about that before she moves on? Yeah, so I was just going to say, I'm no Chris Newell, but that is two years to recoup and start saving money, um, right. which is a pretty great deal. Mm -hmm. um, it's, also, it's also a great, it's a rare opportunity that schools are offered this uh, grant with the money available. It's usually to municipalities and other agencies. That's kind of a unique thing. And then I have another question, and I'm Perry. I want to ask you, but maybe pull in um, Elizabeth as a long-term board member and a very sharp memory. Um, previously, didn't we get this opportunity maybe five or six years ago? and take advantage of that. Do you remember the details or are you aware of them, Perry? Can one of you speak to it from what you remember? I'm not aware of it? the details, but we have um, taken advantage of something like this in the past and it did pay off very well. Yeah, uh, Greg, Greg Marles had presented, I don't know what year it was, but uh, he came with a similar, similar grant um, that did a, a portion of the classrooms within the building this would be this particular project will do everything right down to every closet. I mean, just every light that's in the school would become LED. Um, yeah, so they estimate 1.9 years until our portion would be paid off. The, the real question was um, the, this, this uh, $35,526 is not in the capital improvements budget based on the timing. Um, we didn't know these numbers back when the budget was being made. Um, but we could maybe finagle some stuff. And then like Donna had said, we're, we're, we're just waiting to see where things go in the future. But just wanted to let you guys know that this is out there and is something that has a possibility of getting done if you're interested. Elizabeth. I think that we need to be careful of being uh, penny wise and pound foolish, even though we are trying to, you know, really scrimp and save and do what we can with this budget. So, um, as Perry said, if there's a way to finagle and, you know, move some things around, this sounds like quite a good deal. Are there other questions? Nasser. I think some of my questions were answered, but uh, I was going to ask uh, whether it was it this includes exterior lighting as well or not. And uh, also, I know Perry, this is going to be a hard question. Are we talking about ten thousand bulbs? Or are we talking about twenty thousand bulbs? Do you think? Uh, I don't actually know the bulb count. Um, actually, I don't. I have that answer. I just don't have it with me tonight. Uh, but I do believe, to answer the first question, I do believe it includes the parking lot lights as well. Um, we do, again, have some of those done. This would be finishing it off and replacing the remainder uh, that needed to be. And also, third question, uh, if we ever go this road, uh, whether the town would consider uh, this as well, because I know the city of Portland and other towns have gotten the LED lights for their streets as well. And uh, if we can basically share resources for 
or what are the, how do they say, hit the bird? No, I don't want to hit the bird. Uh, <laughs> Two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the town is currently working with uh, GP Cog on uh, replacing street lights and doing a uh, LED street lighting project. I don't have any information on that. I believe that due to the COVID situation, it kind of took a stall for now. But uh, so, is there any correlation if the, the town does go in our route, and oh, we're not going separately? We can go. If we go together, will we do have more saving? Is my question. Uh, I this this is not a municipal. Okay. Event. It's strictly for schools. Okay. okay. I love the idea, though. <laughs> right. Right. It doesn't hurt asking. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I have one more. Oh, yes, Heather. Um, and it has to do um, with, um, I know the building project is on hold and the conversation about renovation and new buildings is very much on hold, but the situation and the state of our buildings has not changed. Um, and they're gonna need, need to be addressed at some point down the line. And so my question being, is that part of the reason that you're talking about the high school? Because we had talked about working with Con Cove and the middle school sooner than the high school. So is that the reason that you're focusing there? And then the other question I have is if it gets to the point and we end up replacing the high school building or renovating it, can these LED lights be transferred? Is that a possibility or is that just too far down? I mean, is that a known? I, I, I it is based on the, uh, the uh, I guess the, uh, the replacement of a high school or renovation of a high school being a project that's uh, further away in the distance that we, we chose to do the high school um, as the main focus of this project. The, as far as replacing the lights, the, the thing with a lot of projects like this is an answer to your question is yes, we could do that, but I don't know that the savings would be that great. An LED, a typical two by four LED light fixture that sits up in a recessed ceiling is about, uh, I'll say around $120, $130. And when, when you take the amount of labor of what it would take for somebody to unwire all those and remove them and store them, so they don't get damaged and things like that. You you lose money quickly in the in the loss of the the labor cost. And um, I, I think at best it would be a wash. But um, you know, that's definitely a great a possibility. answer. I mean, it is yeah. if you, if you look at it as it being better than it being in a landfill fill and a, a more greener approach, then then the answer is absolutely yes. If it's a financial question, then it's pretty much a wash. All right. That's good information. Thank you so much. Any other questions before we ask Marcy to move on now, sir? So I, yeah, I presume uh, I had that question in my mind, but I presume the there will be restriction by the grant as well for how long you can use this or for how long it will be good as well before you place them. There must be some restriction on them as well. Uh, I, I know the project has to be completed by, I believe it's the end of August, Marcy? Right, August 31st. So we, we are, we have a limited timeline. Um, uh, they, need, they need to know by June 26th, and then we have a, basically just the summer to do the project. It, it would be a little bit of a juggling act with the cleaning of the school going on at the same time as well, but um, we can make it happen. Great. Okay, anything on that? Oh. Okay, Go so ahead, Marcy. Yeah. All right. I wanted to uh, keep you all informed on the backpack donations. The total amount that's been donated right now between the community and full plates, full potential, is six thousand nine hundred and forty-five dollars and five cents. So, um, and it's it slowed down a little bit, but we still have been receiving some checks, as well as the fact that I know Peter has applied to two other grant sources, and so we'll hear word on that soon, and it will go into that uh, revenue account. Um, so we are getting very close now to our final month, and at the end of May, our little graph here, 
Do you want to share your screen, Marcy? You're yeah. To do that. Okay. If you have better luck than I did. <laughs> let's see. Let's see, Donna. If I can get this. Um, okay. So let me pull up right here. Can everybody see my screen okay? All right. Yes. So the end of May, the typical percentage would have been 92% spent. We were at 88% spent. Now, last year at this time, we were at 89% spent. So the, the percentage spread is uh, pretty similar. Last month, we had a 4% spread between the percentage of the year and the amount we were. And we, same thing for this month. So it's been a pretty um, consistent pattern. We are down, we're going a little bit more oh, in the, I'm flipping over now to our projections for our year end. That really is kind of for this year end as well as projecting out for the, for the end of next year as well. Our revenue projections stayed pretty stable. We have had a little bit more happening in our category where we had some EL needs that we had to kind of basically borrow from our substitute line. And we had some tutoring costs in there for some needs, for student needs. But everything else pretty, pretty much staying the same. Nutrition services, this is why when we are going after the FEMA, fingers crossed we get considered for some FEMA money, we are going to ask for help specifically in this area to get some help with this. So that's what, so any kind of relief we can have uh, from grant sources, we're gonna try to really target this right here at this point um, because it's, uh, it's a great cause and it's a, it's a high need. So this is totally something that we're gonna keep focused on. And um, like I said, fingers crossed that we can keep going after more sources and bottom line, projected net surplus and fund balance by next year at this time, we're hoping is still to the good. So let me see if I have anything else in my notes, you guys. Um, I think that's it, unless there are some questions. And I'll get back in here, Donna, and the trick that I always find is being able to unsave. <laughs> so here we go. All right, there we go. All right, any questions? Marcy, you, you covered the two questions that I had. Number one was going to be, are we thinking about using the FEMA money to help out with the food services program? So that's awesome. And then um, my other question was around um, the health of the fund balance. And so I'm glad that you highlighted that at the end. It's looking good. Thank you. Yes, and Elizabeth, just to that, I think with the FEMA money specifically, they are targeting, in this category, they're targeting the nutrition services for, for children. So this is good. That's great. Yeah. And when I find out more, I'll make sure I keep everybody posted because I'm kind of learning as I go with, with the FEMA world. The FEMA world's very scary, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, Donna. Well, I'm going to try to share my screen again. Let's see if this works. Ah. Yay. Easy. Okay. So um, last year, or this year, really, when um, in one of our building committee meetings, several people suggested that we update our enrollment projection um, study. So Marcy and I looked around for um, some companies and it, it was, we didn't find a lot of companies that are still doing this. We did find some and we got some estimates. Some were many thousands of dollars. Um, so we kept looking and we came across um, the NESDEC, which is the New England School Development Council. And this is a very reputable organization that works with many New England schools. And they offered an enrollment projection um, if we uh, joined their uh, organization. So with membership, with membership in the organization, 
um, they would do a, an enrollment projection study. So we decided to go with that. They also do, um, they offer professional development. They offer a lot of services um, to schools. So it was a very uh, effective, cost-effective for us. And they based their study um, basically on um, uh, what other companies base their studies on, historical data regarding births, building permits um, in the town, real estate sales, and other similar factors. So the study begins with, and I am, see if I can back this up. Here we go. The study begins with um, historical, sorry, I don't want to make you seasick. <laughs> um, <laughs> historical enrollment by grade. Um, from 2009, 2010, up through um, uh, 2019, 20, present, presently. So you can see, um, exactly what our uh, historical enrollment was. And as Heather um, talked about last night when we were talking about enrollment with town council, enrollment varies from day to day. Um, kids move in, kids move out. Um, the state looks at the October 1 enrollment count as their um, important date and many of the um, Many things are based, uh, that come from the state, such as our subsidy based on October 1 date. They also look at April 1 as another benchmark. Um, when we talk about enrollment, we keep usually more up to date and you get your enrollment sheet, which is in your packet um, every month. So we really track it um, month to month when, when we're looking at enrollment. I think interesting is down here at the bottom, the historical percentage changes. Um, and you can see where um, the enrollment went up, the percent, the enrollment went up, the percent, the enrollment went down. And um, really it's pretty, pretty stable. Um, fairly small changes in percentage. And you all have this document, it was in your supporting documents. And this is just um, a bar graph showing uh, the historical enrollment. And this is from 2009-10 uh, to 2019-20. Um, so you can see that we are really the same as last year. And then we have our projected enrollment. And this shows the projected enrollment um, up through 2024, um, actually 2000, yeah, 2029 to 30. Um, so you can see what the projected enrollment is from the school year 2000, this present school year. And so we go from 1575 to 1581, which is a six student increase. And going down to the projected percentage changes, you can see again, um, percentages uh, each year with a, um, by, 2029 to 30, 2038, 0.4% um, change from that, um, from class to one class to another. And here we have um, the bar graph showing the same thing. So you can see some years we go down a little bit, some years we go up a little bit, um, fairly stable. And here, uh, here's a graph with including uh, historical data that goes all the way back to 2009, from 2009 to 2029. You can see what our enrollment does. And again, ups, a few ups, a few downs. Um, but fairly stable. So I guess, Donna, can I speak for a second? Sure. Just to add a little more historical um, perspective here, this graph that we're seeing, this line graph, is coming down in history 
Um, but the date that it starts with is 2009. And if we go back actually to our previous materials, it starts in 2000, it actually shows more stability because in 2006, there was a little peak that went up. And I think that's associated to the building of Cross Hill, the big development. So if you go back all the way, I know there looks like there's a little decline here, but if you go all the way back to 2000, it actually is consistently hovering around that line of 1600, I believe. It's even more stable than what it looks like in this because it doesn't go back far enough. All right. it's doing is showing the decline from that peak. So I just wanted to point that out. And then this is interesting, interesting because it, um, it shows the relationship between um, the births and, um, and our, our kindergarten enrollment. And then Don Kennedy, um, who uh, works with NESDEC, um, offered this further explanation. For a decade, you have experienced about 60 births a year and the pace continues. By the time a group reaches kindergarten, additional families have moved in, yielding a kindergarten cohort of about 100 to 110 students. Grades one to eight remain generally stable, in the most recent eight years, the grade one to eight total has increased by two additional students per grade per year. The NASDAQ forecast suggests a K-12 total that is expected to increase slightly each year with the exception of the effect of the graduation of the large class of 2022. That said, it's too early to obtain information concerning the effects of the pandemic economy. So. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, as we enter um, back, hopefully at some point in the near future, into our building committee and we have the enrollment study or the enrollment conversation, we do have this up-to-date study. So any questions or comments about that? I can't see you, so if you have a comment, you'll have to. I just wanted to say thank you for having this done and thank you for presenting it. It's always good to have the most up-to-date information. And it's kind of interesting to look, if you look five years after 2008, which was the last um, kind of downturn in the economy, however people want to describe it. If you go five years out from that, that's when we see kind of a drop in those kindergarten births, uh, you know, enrollments really, because, you know, a lot of people chose to um, kind of defer having children during that time. So I think, you know, that's a really, it's interesting to see that. It's something that I always thought that would be there and there it is. So five years out from now, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Great, so that's the first part. I'm going to try to pull something else up. Okay. So I also want to talk about um, the reopening of school and um, our plans um, going on, uh, going forward for that. We are eagerly awaiting direction from the state. <laughs> It's not coming. Um, as we were reminded at a recent Drummond Wood Woodsome webinar, governor's orders close the schools. So governor's orders will have to reopen the schools. And that's something I, we don't say a lot. And I think we have to really keep that in mind. Um, but uh, as, as some of you heard me say last night that um, over a month ago, um, we were told by the Commissioner of Education that in the governor in consultation with the DOE and the CDC would reopen our schools, probably region by region, according to our um, spread and outbreak data. And at that time we were told that Cumberland County would probably be one of the last uh, regions to open their school buildings. And um, I think probably the data still supports that. So. Um, with that being said, um, we sometimes talk crystal balls, but it would appear that we most probably will be starting school with remote learning in the fall. 
and hopefully moving into buildings when the data supports the move. Most probably, but that is not by any means written in stone. Um, because we also know that businesses are in need of their workers returning to work and families are in need of uh, our schools reopening to provide childcare for their children. So it could be that economic pressure might move the governor to open schools earlier. I don't know. This is just conjecture. So we, um, I'm gonna try to share this now with you. Um, earlier we did a survey of oh, parents and actually teachers. Um, this, can you, oh, can you see our pie graphs? Great, okay. Um, we did a very general survey and I know that there was some frustration because um, people wanted more details and it was just meant to be a very general gather some initial information survey. Um, and this was about parents could give the opportunity to respond for more than one student and for more than one student who um, might be in different schools. Um, so these are the results of um, the parent uh, surveys. And we combined, uh, they could respond up, up to five students. So um, you can see that, and the last set of data over on the left should say uh, high school, not, Pete, not Pond Cove. So, um, so if you look at the charts, we have uh, Pond Cove and the, the choices were 100% remote learning, 100% in building, or a combination of both. Um, so you can see that the, the graphs, the, the pie graphs are amazingly similar. Um, with the high school and the middle school um, parents um, being a little bit more uh, interested in um, the combination of both, I believe, no, sorry. Yes, the no, I think you're correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking at used to looking at this ch this chart in red, yellow, and blue. Oh. So Marcy changed the colors on me. Uh, not Marcy, uh, Jen. So, um, so this is where uh, people came out. Um, the orange is 100% remote learning. The gray is 100% in building, and the uh, yellow is the combination of both. Um, you can see that people are really interested in having their students back in school. And I think that's what we wanted to know. Um, are we okay with remote learning? Or do, do our parents want their kids back in school? And I think this clearly tells us that, um, that parents want their students back in school. Um, so with such an interest, and I'm gonna stop sharing now. With such an interest um, in having their students are back in our buildings, at least some of the time, because if you look at if you looked at um, the combination of the gray uh, people who wanted their their students uh, in school 100% of the time, and the parents who wanted their their students in school at least some of the time, it was really around 80% um, of parents. Uh, that, that were interested in having their kids come into the school buildings. Um, and with the absence of guidance from the state at this point, our um, school department, along with other school departments across the state, are left with no other choice to, but to create three separate plans for school in the fall. And that's what most districts are faced with at this point. So looking at the CDC recommendations, um, it really seems unlikely that we would be able to afford to offer 100% in-school academics come fall. Between the um, social distancing requirements, it would, uh, we would have to hire extra staff to cover classes. We would have to um, cut classes in half or in thirds and hire extra staff to, to cover those classes if we even could find the room to do that. Um, so that 
that is sort of a ruling out of that possibility, just totally going back to normal, unless the virus disappears and the CDC can drop its um, recommendations, which probably isn't going to happen. So there's a really good chance that school is not going back to normal in September. So, so that's kind of a given that we're looking at. Um, we, we know that we've survived offering 100% remote learning. Um, it's taken a toll on families and some students. Some students have actually thrived um, doing the remote learning. Uh, we realize that some teachers are more adept at technology and others have had um, very little time to learn a new way of teaching. Many of, our many of our teachers have had their children at home, so they're trying to teach and watch the, their, their students because of uh, the daycare closures and the school closures. But we're hoping with the uh, opening of daycares, um, and daycares uh, are opening up, uh, this situation will improve in the fall. So hopefully um, teachers would, uh, would have, have their students, some of them anyway, in, in daycare. But we do know that we need to invest in possibly some new programs, um, uh, remote learning programs um, are, they're get, the companies are getting wise and they offered a lot of free services at the beginning of all of this. And um, we are anticipating that uh, there, and we've heard already that there will be some costs now to those programs that have been previously uh, provided for free. Um, we would need to continue to provide food for our food challenge families, so that will be a cost. Um, and we really need to do some extensive professional development for our teachers um, in order to provide better academic instruction. We also go into the perhaps 100% remote learning situation, or we would go into it, with the re realization that this probably isn't going to last a whole year. So we need to pre be prepared to go into that hybrid combination at some point um, so we can get our students and our staff back into the school. So this is uh, where we have been uh, putting, uh, A-teams recently been putting our focus on this hybrid model. Uh, students would attend school part-time, um, part of the day or week uh, and would continue with their learning at home as well. Um, and we would f closely follow CDC guidelines when we had those students in our schools and when they were, we were busing them to our schools. Um, this would require, we know, some type of split sessions, either morning and afternoon split, maybe an ABAB -A -B, uh, schedule during the week, maybe an ABC, ABC schedule. Um, something like that, uh, with students working on uh, assignments at home, of course, depending on their grade level on their remote days. So today, um, A-Team met and the principal shared some possibilities at their schools. Um, we discussed the realization that um, having, I think Jeff came up with this, that um, it might be a really good idea to have uh, students in the same families attend school on the same days. So looking at um, some kind of alphabetical thing, uh, way that we could, get, we could get students back in the school. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of realizations that, that come as we keep discussing this. Um, and that would be especially in Pong Cove in the middle school to have like the same family, kids in the same family come on the same days. Uh, we invited the nurses today to participate in uh, our conversation so we could get their viewpoint and they have been meeting carefully, uh, meeting with um, the uh, nurses around the state and um, are very uh, up to date on the, the uh, PPE and the CDC recommendations. Uh, I met with Perry and Pat Fowler last week and we discussed the question, could we even bus our students to school? How would that work? So we talked about the possibility of busing only K to eight students, which is uh, what we're legally required to do. Um, students would uh, need to sit one student to a seat. That's the recommendation we're hearing right now. 
students in the same family could sit in the same seat, which again would go back to having students in the same families come to school because that would help with the bus busing situation. They could sit together in the same seat. Um, and students would be required to wear masks on the bus. Um, eventually, uh, probably sooner than later, we would need some kind of a commitment from parents so we would know exactly which parents would be willing to drive their students, um, which uh, students would need uh, busing, and we would, um, we would need to say that we would have to pick up a student in the same place every day, and we would have to drop them off in the same place after school. It, that, those two could be two different places, but in order to sh ensure um, social distancing on the buses, um, right now, um, some students go one place every single day of the week. Uh, they're dropped off at different places. So um, we just wouldn't be able to do that anymore. We would have to um, have parents commit to where they wanted their student dropped off so we could keep a close tabs tab on the numbers of students on the buses. Um, Perry shared with us, uh, we talked about um, plexiglass shields for um, bus drivers and uh, the, the state police has very strict guidelines, rules about uh, plexiglass shields or uh, excuse me, about adding anything to the buses. So um, uh, we're talking about perhaps bus drivers wearing those um, clear shields um, instead of trying to install anything on the bus. Perry, do you want to say something about that? Uh, it's, it's really just more to come. Uh, nobody really has any documentation or, or the State uh, Department of Ed, the transportation end of it, has not issued any guidelines. Um, kind of kind of this, the way it's going with everything right now, just waiting on guidelines. But we do know that when, when the time would come that those guidelines are issued, um, we're, we're probably going to have at least our state, if not the country, all going at one time for a plexiglass system. Uh, currently, right now, I'm being told by Portland Glass that there is a shortage in plexiglass due to all the businesses uh, having the requirement to uh, have things installed. So. Uh, yeah, a lot more to come on that. We're waiting to hear, but you know, if we were to pull the trigger today, then I would say we would end up going with the face shield and we'll know more in the near future. Thanks. Um, Perry talked today with A-Team about plans to provide sanitation stations throughout the schools. Um, and the nurses spoke about uh, having PPE equipment available, um, such as face masks for students at certain times. We need to face desks all in, um, all in one direction and put them uh, a certain distance apart so students are six feet apart. That's a problem with all of the tables that we have in rooms. Um, so we have to think about that and, and really look at each room individually to see what type of furniture they have and how we could socially distance students um, we talked today a little bit about square footage um, in rooms, so we would know how many students could safely uh, be in a room at a time. We know that 20 students could not today be in, a stu in, in the same room under CDC guidelines. Um, so that, that's in conversation. Um, Peter Esposito attends our A-team meetings, and today he talked about plans to serve students. He's been thinking about this. We would have to serve students in their classrooms. Um, he is thinking about pre-wrapped food, and he's already purchased pre-wrapped utensils in preparation for this. Um, there would be no a la carte. There would just be, this is lunch today, and it would be delivered to, um, to each classroom. So A team will be meeting twice a week from now on to continue with these discussions. <laughs> we have a lot to do. Um, we'll also be assembling a team with teacher reps from each building, school board member representatives, uh, our school nurses, the administrative team, a school psychologists, and a few others. Um, so we hope to pull this team together remotely in about two, two weeks, at least uh, it'll be 
within two weeks anyway. Um, and A-Team will continue to talk a lot between now and then and present several options. Um, and the team, which we're gonna call the district planning team, will work out de the details on a district level. And then the, the plans, the district plans will be taken to uh, school leadership teams and they will create plans at school levels. Um, we're hoping that there might be some opportunities for some large remote forums, but um, that would be depending on if, if time is permitting, that would, that would be ideal, where tentative plans would be shared. We think that it would be important to, um, to share with, with the community. So there's a large amount of work that needs to be done in a short period of time. Um, but we need to do this for whatever option um, needs to be put in place in a moment's notice. And um, we know that being prepared for even the hybrid model will be costly, and we've talked about that. Uh, so the target, um, I think, for the development of a completed plan, which actually consists of several plans, um, will be mid to end of July with probably a school board approval meeting at some point in early August. That's very tentative at this point. So that's where we are right now. Do you have any questions? <laughs> we have lots of questions. <laughs> There's a lot to do. I think there are probably many questions, but also the understanding that the answers are not available yet. So um, I know that I look forward to hearing how it all unfolds and how these twice a week a team meetings help us come up with some creative answers. Um, and so, yeah, there's tons but of questions. Everybody's really working hard and, and thinking, thinking a lot. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, Hope. I just was gonna make a comment that um, I, I greatly appreciate all the work that's being done and I recognize all the work that needs to get done and that um, right now, I mean, I think all of us are, um, you know, just regular daily life is a challenge. So I can only imagine the added burden of an absolutely new, um, you know, kind of a mammoth challenge to take on over the summer. And everybody wants the information yesterday in detail with a lot of certainty. And I know, you know, so I just want to, pre to express appreciation to you, Donna, and, and the A team and everyone who's participating in that task. Thank you. Really great. Yep. Could, could I just add and second that? I, um, I, I'm so appreciative um, of all the hard work, just hearing each of you um, check in um, your ability to stay positive and upbeat through this situation. Um, I, from what I've seen, everyone has tackled this challenge um, in, in such a positive and productive fashion and really um, just, you know, given it 110%. And um, I'm so grateful for that. Um, driving um, up to the schools numerous times <laughs> today to, to deliver different children's items back to the school. Um, I, I, I was really struck of the, you know, the lack of endings and, um, and how, how sad and hard um, that is, I think, on both ends for the students and, um, and the staff. And, um, and I, I was so touched and appreciative of the creativity that went into um, figuring out how to deliver diplomas to our graduating seniors, um, just, you know, from, from all, all levels, the collaborative approach to, um, to find a, a way to specially honor them. Um, so anyways, I'm very grateful and appreciative of all that hard work and many hours you all are putting into this. So thank you. Any other comments? Donna, did you have anything else to add? Because Marcy no. had 
that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Marcy um, had wanted to fill one more thing in that she forgot to mention. Thank you so much for that update, that very detailed update, Donna. I'm not sure um, if we had mentioned in our last meeting, but we, Cape Elizabeth did receive the final award amount for the CARES Act through the State Department of Education. So I'm not sure if we told you the last time, but we definitely have an award amount now for the CARES Act through the Department of Education, and it's $23,098.80. And our superintendent has a team working on how to make plans to make that money go as far as we can. So I just wanted to make sure we, I forgot to add that. All right, thank you. Does anybody have questions or comments for Marcy about the CARES Act? And then thanks for going for it and getting that money. All right, so moving on, we have new business. Uh, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve um, Haley Malm as world language teacher for Cape Elizabeth Middle School. I second that. Any discussion or comments? Is um right. is this replacing uh, retiring uh, Lisa Leonard? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So for the vote, Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr, yay. Phil Saucier, yay. Elizabeth Seifried, yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Well, congratulations to Helly Mom. Welcome to the team. Uh, May I have a motion? I move we grant the superintendent of schools authority to hire school personnel, excluding administrative positions, which will require board approval during the summer. Is there a second? I second that. Thank you. Um, and this is an action that we take every and this is an action we take every year, correct, Donna? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, things are falling apart here. Uh, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura didn't need to know. Yay. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, may I have a motion for item 7C? Was this the one that we were striking the second? Is that not correct? Yet. Not, not yet. Okay. So. I move we approve the policy for the second reading ACAA as described in our supporting document. May I have a second? Second. Uh, and Hope, can you speak to this? Thank you. I sure can. Um, so this is the policy ACAA harassment and sexual harassment of students. This is the set of edits we saw last meeting, I believe, and they are, um, sort of updates that we've been that have been on the table for quite some time since last perhaps last June I believe um, to include uh, include gender identity and expression um, to include a reference to our JLFA child sexual abuse prevention and response policy 
um, and to make other small tweaks to the policy. Um, so just to make a clarification, we had considered at some point to include a definition of confidential employees within this policy. That has since been taken out. So everything here is pretty, um, you know, sort of it's it's not um, not sort of material uh, changes from the existing policy. Um, while we're here, um, and sort of to, because the, the next item on the agenda is related, um, what we did was we took the definition of confidential employees, uh, which was something that was very important to uh, a, a good number of the staff who are under a professional obligation of confidentiality, um, and we took that and we put it into our ACAA procedure. Um, so what it does is it sort of codifies that concept that we, res we respect that those staff members have this obligation under their own uh, licensure or state law. However, in cases of um, uh, our Title IX requirements and uh, other state mandated reporting requirements, there, there may be exceptions to that, that bubble of confidentiality. Um, and all of this being said, I want to note one additional wrinkle that's a very, very big wrinkle, which is uh, the Title IX regulations have been sort of in this state of limbo for, a, for almost a decade now, um, where there was the Title IX regulations plus guidance. So there was the guidance from the Obama administration, and then that was revoked later by the subsequent administration, and we have been waiting for the new regulations, meaning it's, it would then be law to come down and, and give us a more solid uh, set of guidelines with respect to what does a school need to do to, to meet its obligations under Title IX. So about a week before this policy, our last policy meeting, we, we got, you probably may all be aware of this, the Title IX regulations finally became law. Um, and these will affect, uh, mostly have a, a greater impact at, at the higher education level in colleges and universities, but it also has an impact for us. And what it means is by August of this year, we need to address certain changes in the actual regulations um, in our policy with respect to what, you know, how we treat Title IX um, uh, issues. Specifically, it has more, um, it has specific language around the definition of sexual harassment. Uh, it has some different um, tweaks to um, uh, burdens of proof and, and how you treat um, the individuals involved in, a, in, the, um, the, um, in, any, in any issue. So what we decided to do was we said, you know, we've done a lot of this work and this concept of the confidential employees is something that is really important to us, and we want to we want to address this and sort of close the the chapter, close the book on this issue uh, for this school year. Um, we need to update ACAA to include gender identity and expression. It's long long overdue to do that. Um, so what we want to do is have the board approve tonight the modified ACAA with the caveat that we know within the next six months or less, we're going to, you know, the, the, the procedure will need to be updated to meet the new requirements of, of the Title IX regulation changes. So um, ACAA is for vote for approval, which, which we're asking the board to do tonight. Um, the next item on the agenda is ACCR, which is the policy, and technically the board doesn't approve it, but we want the board to look at it and acknowledge the, the changes that are being made. Um, and that, that's pretty much it for this agenda item. Okay. Thank you for that update. Are there any questions? Follow through. All right. Seeing none, uh, starting to vote. Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Congratulations. That made us feel great to pass that one. And um, so I'm guessing, Hope, that you're comfortable 
that we included item D in the discussion. And so moving on to item E, this is the one where second reading has been taken out. Uh, so if there is um, a motion. I move that we consider to approve policy JLCA. Right. Thank you. Um, so Hope, can you explain this and why we're taking out second reading, please? Sure thing. And it's not a second reading. It's <laughs> technically or, not a second reading. So yeah, that's what it's just a it's a um, we're just being very I want to be clear that we didn't the language we're looking at tonight is new. Um, what's a little confusing is that we did look at this policy um, at the last meeting. Um, and we'd made some edits to it, knowing that we didn't want to implement it those changes prior to the the coming school year because we didn't want families to have to address those changes until the next school year. So we had made some edits and we set it aside thinking we were done. Um, and between that point and, and the next policy committee meeting, um, uh, Karen Jenkins, the high school nurse, brought to our attention um, that some new guidelines coming from the, um, the main principals association um, with reference to um, uh, examination requirements for, for school athletes. So um, the recommendations are to address the fact that students aren't, aren't necessarily going to be able to get into doctor's offices to complete examinations and they wanted to sort of acknowledge that and give schools guidelines on how to, how to manage that. So to the extent we have um, fall athletics, um, the guidelines are that schools can use other mechanisms. It won't require a, a, an official physical examination by their physician. So what, what, um, what Karen did, which is very, very helpful, is um, she created some language to address this modification within our policy that um, sort of gives us this flexibility. And this is intended to be only for one year. It's for this coming fall. Um, and the language, what it does is it says, um, because of the, the um, uh, inability to necessarily have a well child visit, um, a medical note by a qualified healthcare provider stating extended clearance may be submitted. So what that does is it just sort of gives a general exception to the physical examination requirement. Um, uh, it doesn't change anything else about who, who must get the exam and, and how often they need to get it. But for this fall, they'll have, be able to submit a letter basically saying they're, they're, they're approved for some period of time based on whatever that um, healthcare provider determines. And um, the, the, the wrinkle, additional wrinkle is we'd like to have this in place so that it's there to, for policy for the nurses and the schools so that they're ready come August before the season starts that they can accept these sort of this modified version of um, uh, their, their doctor's uh, approval. So even though this is the first time we're showing these edits tonight, we're asking the board, we being the policy committee, um, to approve it uh, right off to, so that we can, it's sort of an emergency um, modification. Thank you, Hope. Are there any questions? Elizabeth? I just wanted to speak in support because, um, and acknowledge that this is not our typical um, procedure. So anybody in the public witnessing now or that goes back and watches this later, um, this is done uh, basically because we're in an emergency situation and these guidelines have just been um, distributed to all the schools from the Maine Principals Association and we need to have this on the books um, as soon as possible. So that's why it's not going through second read. It's just, it's sort of like an emergency update and the policy will commit, committee will have to reconvene and go back to the um, suggestions that we were talking about and probably take this clause out soon. Yep. It looks like we have some of the nurses here. Do you have anything to add or are you comfortable uh, Karen, with what's been said? Yeah. Karen's here. Um, yeah. So I'm Karen Jenkins, the school nurse from the high school. So the, the proposed changes are really quite minimal. Um, I mean, I think ultimately we want to move towards, you know, the 
the policy you discussed last month, but um, it was really felt like this is the time to be requiring less, not more at this point. Um, the MPA actually had suggested some language that a nurse or athletic trainer can kind of uh, screen um, the health surveys or the health history updates. And we all felt like really, we didn't wanna be the one making that decision if someone has an extension of their physicals, that it should be up to their healthcare provider. So, you know, the biggest, the biggest change from what we've been doing over the last few years is just saying, if you haven't had a physical within this calendar year, that's okay, just get us clearance. And if a healthcare provider didn't feel comfortable with that, they could just um, make an appointment and you know, get an update. But they're the ones making that decision, not the, not the school nurses or a trainer. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Addition. Any other comments or questions? All right, and then a vote. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Excellent. And hope so. We have one more policy to talk about. May I have a motion? I move we approve policy second reading JS as described in the supporting document. Thank you. A second. Second. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hope, you're on. So this one's pretty straightforward. This is the second time we're seeing JS, Suicide Prevention, Intervention, and Response. It's um, the MSMA sample. It's a required policy. Um, we need it. We've seen it. Let's prove it. <laughs> um, it's, it's an important policy, and it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's what we looked at last month. So we're asking the board to approve it. OK. <laughs> Any comments, questions? All right, so the vote, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the next item is the resignation of Michael Scarponi, the high school band director. Um, is there anything to say about that or are we just announcing it? Just announcing. Okay. Uh, are there any school board agenda requests? Seeing none. Uh, committee reports policy. Uh, we've already probably heard everything, correct, Hope? No new information? Okay. I saw the head shake, yes. Uh, <laughs> technology, path, student wellness, building and grounds, legislative liaison, those are all on hold. Um, so the announcement for upcoming meetings, um, I just want to point out that last night there was a town council meeting for anybody who in the public who is watching this uh, where there was some public comment. There was a portion of it. There was some public comment around the school board portion of the budget. There was also the opportunity for Donna to provide a very excellent um, update of where we are with the budget and the needs and the potential costs and what we've heard a little bit tonight around, but around the budget of what it will take to open the schools. Um, it had been a while since town council members and had heard from us uh, in that regard. So that I thought was very positive and beneficial. Uh, and there was some discussion around it. So if you're interested, it is taped. It's I'm sure on the town website under the meetings. Um, next, regular town council meeting and public hearing for school budget. That was what I was saying was last night. Town council vote is uh, this June 15th. It's this coming Monday at seven o'clock. So 
We hope that they uh, approve our portion of the budget. Um, and so we'll see. And then we have a workshop. So we were gonna take this and then we decided to keep it on. Wanna speak to that? Uh, well, we may need it, it more. Just, yeah, so we're, so we're not. On. Yeah, we're 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 not sure uh, what's on the workshop agenda, but we're thinking it might be important to have there to um, inform people about what's going on. Is that a pretty good summary? Of why we kept it on there? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, excellent. So, um, may I have a motion? I move we adjourn. Excellent. Second. I second that. Any discussion? <laughs> All right. Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yippee yippee. <laughs> 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 Yay. <laughs> Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you all so much for being here, for all the work that everyone does, and um, have a great night. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.